Well, welcome uh, everyone to the University of Arizona Museum of Arts Thursday at Home Virtual Art Talk, The Coping in Context and Magic of Making Do, a conversation with artist Lex Jurassic. My name is Chelsea Farrar and I'm the Curator of Community Engagement for the U of A Museum of Art. Thank you all for being here today. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Arizona sits on the homelands of indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial, including the Tohono O'odham and uh, Pasquayaki, and we recognize the 22 sovereign nations of what is now called Arizona. Aligning with the university's core value of a diverse and inclusive community, it is our responsibility to recognize and acknowledge the people, culture, and history that make up the wildcat community. At the institutional level, we must be proactive in broadening awareness throughout campus and beyond to ensure our students feel represented and valued. And in this virtual format, I know that many of our guests are often joining us from across the United States and often um, even outside of the United States. And so I encourage you all to learn more about the indigenous lands that you currently inhabit. Um, and again, welcome everyone. I love to see, in fact, where folks are joining us from. Um, so in the chat, if you feel comfortable, go ahead and uh, make a comment on what city and state you're currently, you're currently residing in. And we're super excited to have you all here virtually um, here for, join us here for this talk. Um, so I'd like to first introduce one of our staff members who is always here at our public programs um, and is critical to the museum being able to offer these um, educational programs like this for the public and for our members. Uh, Natasha Allen, the U of A Museum of Arts Coordinator for Members and Donors. Hi, how are you? Thanks, Chelsea. I'm excited for this talk tonight and I'm excited to be here. Um, before I begin though, um, I would be remiss if I didn't give a huge thank you to our museum members. Membership is a great way to advocate for the arts, build a sense of community and support one of Tucson's greatest museums. If you're not a member, I only ask one thing. If you enjoy tonight's talk, if you learn something or if you just enjoy some engaging dialogue that you'll consider becoming a member or that you'll make a donation to our education fund after tonight's event. And lastly, I wanna highlight a few events that we do have coming up. The first one is on February 1st, we have our members talk um, and that will be at 12 p.m. And that is for members exclusively. So if you aren't a member and you wanna participate, I highly encourage that you do sign up. On February 11th, we have our very popular art trivia, which will be love theme. And you do not wanna miss that, I guarantee. And then on February 18th at 5 p.m., we do have another talk um, centered around our Picturing 2020 um, online exhibition. And I will hand it back over to Chelsea. Thank you so much, uh, Natasha. I really appreciate that. And yes, thank you to um, everyone for joining us um, and definitely our members who also, um, as Natasha said, help make these programs possible. Um, Lovely. Well, because we have so many people joining us um, this afternoon and this evening, I do want to uh, make a suggestion that if you're having any problems with connectivity bandwidth, um, that um, it would be great if folks um, turn off their video actually on Zoom. Um, you'll still be able to um, participate and see us here. Um, and in Zoom, um, I do encourage you to participate, join in on the conversation using the chat feature. You'll see the icon at the bottom of your window. Um, so you can enter any questions you have for us during the conversation tonight at any time. And we're also streaming this live on Facebook. Um, so those of you that are over on Facebook watching us tonight, welcome. Um, and you're invited to join in the, in the conversation as well. So if you leave us a comment or a question over there on Facebook, we'll be sure to migrate that over here to Zoom. Um, and we'll be saving time at the end to have a um, conversation Q&A um, with you all that are joining us. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing there real quick. Uh, fantastic. And, um, and so tonight's program, The Coping Context and Magic of Making Do, a conversation with the artist Lex Jurassic is part of this spring's uh, series of programs highlighting artists from the U of A Museum of Arts online exhibition, Picturing 2020, A Community Reflects. Uh, Willa Alshweed, the museum's assistant curator of education, was a 
co-curator for this year's exhibition, um, along with our curator of exhibitions, Olivia Miller and myself. Um, Willa is joining us tonight. Um, Willa, can you tell us a little bit more about this exhibition? Thanks, Chelsea. I would love to. Um, so Picturing 2020 is our first fully online exhibition, and it features the work of over 150 Southern Arizona artists, including Lex, um, who all answered an open call to submit artworks created during the year 2020. Um, the process of planning this exhibition was kind of a whirlwind starting last March when it became clear we would need to be uh, closing our door to the public for kind of an uncertain amount of time and adjust our plan for exhibitions, not to mention create some space to process everything going on in the world. It began kind of thinking about um, just quarantining and what were we making in quarantine, but it quickly became clear with um, as we faced the realities of physical isolation, grief, divisive national politics, uh, the Bighorn wildfire here in Tucson, uh, police violence, uh, murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Carlos Adrian Ingram Lopez here in Tucson, many others, all of these challenges, traumas layered on top of each other, we realized that we needed to kind of start from scratch and create an exhibition that could be a way for people to communicate and to reflect on everything that was happening. The responses we received to the call were really incredible as curators to go through them. We started pulling out themes um, and the exhibition really shows how unique everyone's experience has been this year, but also looking through the artworks, it's a really uh, relatable and connected feeling when you find something that's familiar to you to see that someone else is maybe experiencing that as well. So I highly recommend you check out that online exhibition. We'll put the link in the chat and it will be up through March. So you'll still have a few more talks this spring to hear from other artists in that exhibition. I'll hand it back to you, Chelsea. Awesome, thank you so much, Willa. Um, yeah, and we'll drop that link in the chat. Um, it's a fantastic exhibition um, and yeah, and a perfect context um, for me to introduce uh, our guest here tonight. So without any further ado, um, I definitely want to introduce um, our guest artist that's joining us tonight. And we were just absolutely in incredibly honored to have uh, her contribute an original recent work of art for this really special exhibition. Uh, so the artist Lex Jurassic has exhibited her work nationally for over 20 years, most notably in 2009 as a featured artist in the exhibition Kokeshi, Folk Art to Art Toy at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles, California. In 2017, her video was made part of the permanent collection at the Getty Institute as part of Miranda July's Joni for Jackie archive. Recently, she has delved into public art, completing a mural with the city of Tucson's Downtown Murals Project, as well as a temporary immersive exhibition at the Scottsdale Public Library with the Scottsdale Public Art. Much beloved in Tucson, she was nominated in 2018 for the Tucson Weekly Best Visual Artist Award. Welcome, uh, Lex Jurassic. Thank you so much for joining us virtually uh, today. Thank you for having me from my house. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, well, so maybe we can um, join uh, start off um, our talk by maybe sharing some of your work with people that are less familiar with your work. That'd be great. Uh, I expect no one to be familiar with my work. And so this was um, actually the, um, the piece that you submitted for the exhibition, correct? Yes, it was. And I made it in, I believe May. So at the beginning of COVID, I started making my own paper and creating uh, the series that I call Flower Mounds. And I know that you, you actually submitted um, we allowed 
submissions, people to submit up to three works. And then we selected um, one from that, from those submissions. Um, and it was all your flower mounds that you, like three examples from the flower mound series, right? Yes. Yeah. And this one really stood out, I know, for the three of us that were curating the show. As I mentioned, it was Willa, myself, and Olivia Miller, our curator of exhibitions. Um, it was really unique. And it was the only one that had this additional element of the rainbow. Um, but it was, it was unique in this kind of um, you know, like pantheon history of landscapes with rainbows is that it was like a broken rainbow and it had this, I don't know, it just has this little tinge of like, it's hopeful and then not as well as this little rainbow has been broken, right? Yeah, I, I mean, the work that I'm personally attracted to, like that I have in my home is, does have that kind of sweet and sour, hard and soft, so when I was working on it, I originally began, I, it, it didn't start broken. It wasn't something that I went into it. I started painting and I uh, originally meant to connect those two or have two rainbows, but it just kind of painted itself. I kind of, <laughs> I went with the contours of the paper that I had made. I always kind of feel like you know, a woodworker, like, okay, well, this piece is going to tell me where I should go. So I just yeah. want to speak to me. No, it's beautiful. And that's, I think, something else that really stood out for us and when we were curating the show is that it was um, a piece on handmade paper. And so the actual objects, object itself is, the, the whole thing is, is um, handmade by you, the, the surface as well. And so that texture, the edges of the, the frame of the object, um, just it, it, all of it just kind of um, stood out to us as, as a really beautiful and unique, unique piece. Well, and as I, you know, kind of see my work, how it fits into the context of what's happening in art now, I feel like, you know, between 3D printers and, you know, anyone can create something that's polished and shiny and realistic. And so with my work, it's like, I really want to create work that feels like it's been pulverized or it feels like you, you can see the human touch because I could print something, I could make something, I could have someone fabricate something that uh, where all that is gone, where the fingerprint of humanity is gone. So this piece was really, <laughs> there's lots of squeezing involved. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, it is definitely one of those works that even, even on the screen, you can see that. And I know that was definitely one of the reasons why we selected it because it, it visually displays all that. Even, even on the website, you can tell that this is something that has has weathered the artist artist touch, mm -hmm. um, and Humans and a lot of involved. Yes, it's right, <laughs> and a lot of that. I mean, that connects to like the theme of the show, right? Is like humans weathering and withstanding the past year of of twenty twenty, right? Definitely. Um, well, I'll just show maybe like one more as another example of of a piece that's from this series. I'm um, just so it's those another, that, those it's another aren't familiar. flower mound. <laughs> and this piece right. was um, it, again early on, and it was it's on a um, piece of really tissuey thin uh, paper. I didn't make it because it would have been like a half inch thick if I had made that paper. But I um, it was paper that I had and had just schlepped from move to move, had in storage. And so as this, you know, uh, unknowing of like what's going to happen with um, COVID set in, I just started looking around my studio and was like, what, asking myself, like, what haven't I used? What, what do I have here? Like, let's start there. Let's use it up. Right. And so, I mean, that's like the, the, the topic of uh, the talk, right, is like making, making do in these unusual times, right? Definitely. Beautiful. Uh, 
pardon me, while I move screens around for a second here. Um, well, I mean, we're, we're talking about like, you know, this context of the exhibition in, in, in 2020, um, but before the politics of 2020, before uh, pandemic, before COVID-19, um, what was what was inspiring you as an artist then? Well, honestly, I can't remember. <laughs> and I feel like that if, if you've experienced like a, a, a big loss, like a major grief, a grief episode, a loss of a person, you, you have a short term memory, but the long term memory is shot. It's a mm. real thing. It's I think they call it um, widow's brain. So for me, I literally had to go back and look and go, who, who was I before this? Um, and early on, I think as I proceeded like way long time ago when this started, I really, really, I really tried to, I made the choice to stop any um, habit of thought that was that started off with when this is over, I will. Oh, when this is over, I'll work out. Oh, when this is over, I'll do that thing. When this is over, I'll make work. So for me, that getting past that barrier really opened up um, a, wor a, a world for me to work in, as opposed to going, okay, well, when when this is over, I'll I'll digest it. That's when I'll do the work about this time. Yeah. I just pushed forward. So, I mean, as you're, as you're going through that, that phase of trying to push forward, um, what, what specifically changed for you as an artist and what stayed the same? What changed and what stayed the same? Um, I really try to work with what I had on hand. Um, and I always work from a place of uh, I can do whatever I want. And that opens, you know, there's a lot of failure in that. But, and, but I always try to work like very unaware of like, like what will people think or when I'm asking myself how to proceed, like, you know, to really push forward and go, I can do whatever I want. So <laughs> that's it's where- It's an I, attitude. It's an attitude. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds like that attitude, it, was bef was with you before um, pandemic and and before the year of 2020 and you've you're applying that perspective and attitude to your work lately. Yeah, I feel like the those um, habits of coping from personal experiences before really clicked into play now. So what, if that makes sense, <laughs> it does. I wonder if you could go into that a little bit more, like what, what past experiences prepared you for this last year for you to be able to cope and, and make do in this way that you beautifully well, visually do. Well, I always created art as a form of escapism from really specifically in my childhood from uh, being, being very ill and being, you know, stuck in bed or stuck in a hospital. So for me, like when I get bad news, I'll find myself like, oh, I need to get in the studio. I need to work this out. And it's a way for me to digest. So for me, having this personally, having to stay home or, and having to shrink my world down to my home and my studios in my home, it was a, it was really easy to do. And it's, it's not natural, I think for a lot of people. And it's not to say like, I don't like to go out or, you know, I, I miss movies. I miss, you know, friendship. <laughs> uh, and I miss, you know, dancing at the club. But for me, the shrinking down, I just embraced it. And, you know, sometimes as artists, we feel like we have to have like studio outside the house or uh, space, you know, to go to, um, to get work done. But for me, it was in my house and I was feeling like, I was winning. <laughs> so your studio space was in your your home already. Yes. So that was not an adjustment for you, or was no, it was an easy it's, adjustment. It's a. It's always been snuggled into my domestic existence. Beautiful. Well, I mean, if anything, 
we all needed some kind of wins last year uh and it's hard to say last year uh, in so many ways some things are carrying over right it's not not over yet but that seems like a a win at least for you yeah i was like i don't have a big fancy studio and i'm and and this is working for me you right. know making do beautiful um and so we were we were talking about your your flower mound series um, and the broken rainbow mound that you um, submitted as part of the exhibition as part of that larger series that you started making last last spring. Um, and I've heard you describe these flower mounds as like akin to a, a love letter to the natural world. Is that right? Yeah, when I started them and they kind of bubbled up from my unconscious. I was just like, I, I'm going to paint myself happy. I'm going to paint work that maybe it comes across as a little daft in these horrific, historically horrific times. And then as time progressed and the heat, it got hotter in Tucson and it was in my home felt a little, you know, unescapable. I was like, oh, these aren't just, the, I'm not painting this to be happy. I'm painting this because I, I had this longing and this, and I, and I really pined for, you know, camping and being out in it. And, um, and then as that kind of came and went and I did leave the house, <laughs> I did go camping. Then I realized most recently that these mound forms have become really akin to uh, traditional burial mounds that are um, an archetype globally. So in Japan and the indigenous cultures of uh, the Americas. So for me, it wasn't, it, it kind of went from this like, oh, I'm so happy, I swear, to like, oh, I miss. And then it's like, oh, these are, these are not about me anymore. These are memorial mounds. Mm, so the meaning for them has, for you has transitioned and evolved. I think that's bit. why I've been able to stick with them you know, as opposed to doing a series of work on one subject that's like 10 to 20 paintings, these have kind of like grown in all directions. Yeah. I think that initial um, phase that you're in is like thinking of them as um, like, I'm going to paint as if I'm happy um, is similar yeah, to manic. like a it's a coping mechanism that reminds me a little bit of um, like gratitude letters. Like even if you're not feeling super thankful or feeling super positive like the there's been studies that show like there's bi positive biological impact in our in our emotions and our our brains when we write thank you letters um and so it's a it's a beautiful coping strategy and even remembering and, and burial mounds is a is a beautiful coping strategy in some way right and coping is great is kind of crazy like for me coping or being positive is a is a choice and I and it's not always successful but um I'm a morbid realist and I can get mired and lost in that as an artist I mean I look at things like really truthfully for myself and then I'm like okay let's reframe this to make this little thing click in my brain in order for me to be able to um, not be sad, <laughs> not weep, weep all the time. I think sensitive people have, have to do that. Yeah. Be okay with that. Be comfortable with that. Yeah. And then there's the, some days fake it till you make it. And I'm, I'm faking it right now. Man. I'm fine. <laughs> You're doing, not at all. Not at I, all. Live, I went to my therapist and I said to her, <laughs> I said, um, I, I'm, I'm, I feel this feeling like I've been crying and I feel like, like, like that feeling after you've cried and on my skin, but I, I haven't cried. And she, and she said, you're sad. <laughs> and I was like, I, it didn't even occur to me that I was sad. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a great coping or I'm, like overpaying my therapist to tell me the obvious, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's tears of a clown. 
yeah. think that's fake it till you make it like i i really love that song tears of the clown like i really relate to it oh well and i i think a lot of people could make some connections to uh your profile pic now that that is uh <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> with, uh, with like the, the fluffy collar and and it, it feels like you've kind of got that like tears of a clown motif uh oh you should sing hear me sing karaoke of tears of a clown i sing it like i'm weeping <laughs> if we have, if we have time tonight maybe it, maybe maybe we'll think share about this. it for programming in the future zoom karaoke don't don't tease us don't tease us uh i love that so beyond um art making in the flower mound series and it sounds like singing and dancing are there <laughs> Other 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 coping strategies uh, that are that are related to your practice as a as an artist. Um, that's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, exercise. I have to force myself to do it, but apparently, it's good for you. And um, you know, I've noticed as a trend over the prior to the pandemic that you know people you know, and they'll say it, oh, people are spending money on um, like experiences, like millennials choose to spend on experiences as opposed to things. And I think that trend has come, you know, directly opposed to saying you can't, you know, have that experience go on that trip. So I've um, been able to interact with people about my work and people I've noticed when I talk to gallerists are wanting to buy art and people or people are wanting to buy art and they're investing in in art, which is a thing, but it's also an experience. Oh, you're, you're paying yeah. like you're paying money to have something on your wall that you're interacting with in a way you wouldn't your stove. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And you're paying for that artist's experience. Like when I'm in that flow and when I'm working, like I can tell when my brain clicks into uh, really being in the zone. And it's kind of that same feeling as when you know you're falling asleep and your thoughts become a little loopy and you're like, oh, I'm falling asleep now. So it's like this unconscious zone and awareness. And for me, like painting these flowers and painting the mounds, like it's kind of, it's compulsive and it also helps helps me sleep at night. So, so my coping is sleeping, <laughs> getting a good night's rest. All positive coping strategies, I would, I would say most people would agree probably. And my therapist would too. <laughs> good. good. <laughs> um, well, I guess the uh, connected to that is, is, I think a lot of people would say that um, your work definitely expresses a lot of joy um, especially for the landscape. And uh, I noticed a lot of people are joining us from Tucson. We, you and I are, are residing in Tucson. And so um, I, I can't help but think that you're, you're, you're having this lovely connection to our local landscape. And I think there's something really significant in that act of like kind of a rebellion in your visual description of what is our natural landscape with these really intensely bright colors and so much green, so many different shades of green. And um, they, they just feel so soft, which is so opposite of what many people would describe as a, a desert landscape. Um, yeah, so you find colors that I, I just, I think a lot of us just don't see in, in our, our desert scene. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that choice of of color that you you use in your color your color scheme. Well, I definitely for me the use of color is an act of rebellion, and for me it's diametrically opposed to this whitewashing of um, of the southwestern United States. There's this like impression that like chic whitewashed adobe is the aesthetic here and. Personally, I find it more of a Northern New Mexico vibe, but when we whitewash the desert landscape and really uh, as artists portray it minimally, 
personally, I feel like it plays into these um, colonial imperialist mentality of these colorists that um, really put forth these ideas that I don't think that even um, most people realize that they have entrenched in their minds unconsciously that um, you know color, pattern, um, texture are all that of the primitive and of the tribal. And um, you know this land, as you stated before, is not the land of those who live here right now. And when we whitewash it, to me, it's in, in beige or beige wash it or brown wash it, it just becomes this thing that is not reflective of, you know, the actual cultures of this area, Mexican and indigenous. So for me, it's like, just not the experience that um, I have, having it be colorless. I know as um, someone who did not grow up here, but I've now lived here for um, over 10 years, my original connection to the space was, was through um, movies. And those were generally like tropes and stereotypes of what the landscape was. And I remember my first spring here, I was absolutely just floored and surprised at how colorful it really can be. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely agree with you that um, that stereotype and uh, those tropes come from a, a place of, of power, which is colonial in nature, 100%. And, but when you're here for a long time, you, you can start to see those colors and it is a beautiful act of rebellion. Yeah, and when you travel regionally, meaning, you know, northern New Mexico down into Sonora, Mexico, you, the, it, it, it becomes this like very, extremely varied landscape. It's a, it's a diverse thing. It's not, my impression of the Southwest not being from here was um, Looney Tunes. Like I thought everything was Arches National Park, and Bugs Bunny, I mean, I hate to say, I mean, those are beautiful cartoons, but you know, they always say like, oh, I accidentally wound up in Albuquerque. And then I wound up in Albuquerque and was like, what is this, you know? And you're, I was instantly disappointed with how small Roadrunners were because <laughs> they did not match my Bugs Bunny oh. experiences. Oh, and they're mean, they're mean little buggers. They're, mur they're lizard murderers. So they're this whole idea like, oh, that roadrunner was so innocent. Mm. <laughs> Bugs Bunny <laughs> had it so wrong. Uh, well, so with that, like, would you say that you're, are you creating your reality or a new reality for the viewer with this body well, of work? I feel like I'm unearthing my, I'm sharing my internal world, but I'm unearthing the unseen. And when I uh, compulsively create art, for me, it's my one true, like when people talk about blind faith, making art for me is my one true action of blind faith, where I'm like, I have to do this. I don't know why it'll be revealed in the ether at some point or not. <laughs> yeah. That, that sense of trusting yourself in the process is really difficult as an artist. It's That's really... exactly what I wrote down was trust the process and not in a basketball context, like trust the process. <laughs> like it's so true, like go on your gut, go with your instinct and, you know, come, come into your own fruition and believe in your vision as an artist. Like the more, the older I get, the more I continue to work, it's like, what, what am I bring? what is unique to me and what am I bringing to the table as an artist? Because right. there's so many things that anyone can do. You can always be influenced by other people, but when you really bring your, hone your vision, it's, it's about, you know, who you are and what you bring to the table. Well, and I, I know that um, as a university, um, Museum of Art, we definitely have a lot of student artists that join us for these talks. And so um, those little words of experience are really powerful and really important as, as, we're, as, as 
artists were constantly figuring out what our visual language is and becoming comfortable with that is really important. Yeah, make what make something that's unique to you. Yeah. And don't and look at other people's paper. <laughs> Keep your eyes on your own paper. I love that. Keep your eyes on your own paper. <laughs> Um, well, speaking of visual language, repetition is absolutely a key part of um, your motif, these repeated forms, um, as we saw, like repeated flowers, um, shapes, as well as series, like you really go into these series and dig deep and, and do a lot of repetition. So what have you thought about, like, what is significant in repetition for you? I, it, it's, it's another coping mechanism and it definitely is intertwined with self-soothing. Um, as a child, I would repeatedly draw the same subject, like fill a notebook with dress designs and do 150 in a couple hours. So I've always kind of created from a space, even with the Kokeshe show at the, um, in LA, it was lots of the same and or lots, many, many coming together to create this vibration. And so for me, it's, yeah, self-soothing and allows me to sleep at night and it's compulsive. Like, just keep doing it. <laughs> Until it feels right. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I love that sense of like shamelessness that you have about that in that coping strategy, I think is really powerful. Well, I wouldn't tell you if I like still sucked my thumb, but this seems like <laughs> fine to do. <laughs> and as someone said in the chat, this is a safe space. Uh, so it would be a, a safe space in order to do so. Okay, I suck my thumb. So, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but we I talk love. about self care, which can be self indulgent. And if you have a family, you may not be able to do, but self soothing is like, you know, I just feel like if you keep yourself relaxed and keep yourself calm, even if you see the train barreling at you, you'll, you're able to respond to any challenges um, from a better frame of mind. So yeah. being happy, being calm, not always possible, but don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty for like keeping it together. Like you don't right. have to be a mess to be an artist. Well, and I think this past year, we've all realized that we have, we all have coping strategies. Some of them are positive and some of them are negative, but they all fall under the category of coping strategies, right? Yeah. yeah. And if, and no one else has come into your house, so they don't know what you're doing. <laughs> that's right. And that's right. Uh, very, very good point. Um, well, so we talked about this idea of like making do a couple of times. Um, so what does that, what does that phrase um, making do mean to you? And I, and I asked that in the, in the context of, um, we, as you mentioned, a lot of us have had to be pretty isolated, working from home, trying not to go out, um, trying to do ourself, our, our um, distancing, social distancing as much as possible. Um, and even as I, speaking for myself, being forced to stay home, Amazon and Target were just a click away. So um, it was really easy for me to quote unquote make do. So what does making do mean for you? For me, making do is that feeling when that the feeling you get when at the moment when something you've saved or something you have finally clicks into having a purpose. And that feeling, that little hit of dopamine can lead to hoarding. <laughs> it can be a very dangerous thing, but when you, when you can't leave the home and just go and pick something out and go get something. Um, I think now in the context of the pandemic, it really has a, a greater power. So for me, like um, I work fast and I think fast. And even if Amazon is a click away and, it, and I can get something in 24 hours, that's not fast enough for me. 
So I would rather solve a problem as part of my creative process than um, pay some money and wait. So, you know, you can make, say, paper at home. <laughs> you can make glue, white glue, before you can go buy Elmer's glue at home. And so when I see people making sourdough bread, I'm like, why not make some glue? Why not make some paper? You know, it doesn't have to be, it can have that same like satisfaction, but um, you know, you can, you can do it yourself before um, capitalism can solve your problems. <laughs> you can solve them yourself. It's, I believe it. I know like we are um, an art school and a, a museum of art that I, as I said, it, we reside on a university campus. And so we're, we're pretty well versed in thinking of art as in the context of solving problems, but I don't think that it's a, um, it's a language that's used very often in the art world. So I love that you expressed oh, it as such. And I bought stuff. I got stuff on the way, things are coming. Like, I'm not gonna lie. I went from uh, uh, being able to go and buy a certain paint to um, really enjoying um, a nicer brand for the first time in my life. And um, uh, also, but it, the, the other side of that coin was that I started working with like house paint that people have given me and uh, utilizing um, unconventional materials, which I kind of always have, but now I feel like it's like art. <laughs> There's no shame in it. It's like, well, I made this during quarantine. Yeah, and making <laughs> making do with what you have because you have to, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now I mean, it's okay to do. In so many ways, I think you had skill sets that set you up to be really successful as an artist working in the pandemic. Because I know this this act of foraging um, and and finding things and and looking for materials in your natural environment. Um, to create artwork has just been part of your process for a long time. Like you've used rocks, sticks, skulls, just things that you've maybe found on, on walks. And then maybe, maybe you've hoarded, I don't know. Um, but what's that, what's that relationship for you between like being a forager and an artist? Well, uh, it, it's a natural curiosity for the natural world. It's like, I want to go, it's, it's, and we've moved around a fair amount. So it's a, a way of acclimating and like grounding myself in a new space. But um, it also relates to a um, repetitive dream that I have uh, where it's like a, like a nightly archetypal dream where I'm like looking for rocks in a river or I'm in a flea market, like looking at trinkets or I'm going through pockets of men's suits coats. So I find that that repeat, the dream that I have, that archetypal dream at night, I bring into my natural world of like, or my waking life where I'm seeking and looking and collecting. And that's probably a little compulsive also, but it is, it's a way of acclimating to new spaces. I love the idea of it. It helps you ground yourself to a new space and understand a new space. Like you get familiar with the textures of the rocks here versus the textures of the rocks at another location because they are very different. How do you know about my rocks? <laughs> I, I've, you've got some beautiful series of rocks. Yeah, what, uh, rocks and I mean, I when I'm in the natural world, it's like, oh, like I'm listening to the trees talk to me. And I'm, you know, I have a real firm belief that, you know, rocks trick you. Rocks that want to be moved trick you into moving them and putting them someplace else. So I have a really intimate relationship with the natural world. Like they're my friends. I, I love that. I wish that more of us had a deeper connection with our, our environment. Well, you just have to talk to some trees and <laughs> be, willi be willing to listen. Mm -hmm. Truly. 
Um, well, I want to make sure that we have time for um, some questions from those of us that are those folks that are joining us. So I have just maybe one last question for you. And um, so this is my prompt to those of you that are joining in. If you have um, questions for Lex, um, definitely put them in the in the chat. Um, so maybe my last question for you is, you know, we're we're now in 2021, which feels a little uh, a little unbelievable. Um, in the, we're it feels like we're supposed to be feeling like we're coming out of a year of <laughs> unease and instability, political unrest, anxiety. Um, but I don't know if all of us have, are ready to unclench our jaws just yet. Um, or, you know, kind of collectively sigh that uh, sigh of relief or say like, okay, we're, we're okay now. Um, we're, maybe we're getting close. Maybe some of us feel that way. I don't, I don't know if all of us do. Um, but your, your Flower Mound series um, that we, we showed in the beginning, um, I think it's, it connects to this idea of resiliency that I think is a really important theme coming out of 2020 and, and probably will be in, in 2021. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if it, that idea of resiliency connects to you as well. Um, but along those lines, I'm wondering if you, you see a role for artists and artists such as yourself during these times of, of big uncertainties and, and anxiety. I, I definitely um, get lost in art to cope with anxiety. And it's something that I struggle with and it affects my sleep. So that's why sleep is such a priority for me. Um, and I really, you know, being a morbid realist, truly, um, as a default, I, um, you know, I really understood the, the gravity of these historical times. Like, I was like, oh, my God, what's, you know, this, this is really weighing on me. And um, I don't think they'll ever end. I don't think there is like a new normal or the old normal to revert back to. I think it's coping. I think that's how we deal with climate change is just adapting and coping. Uh, but I really, because I was like, oh, it's so historical. I really started like shaming myself. Like, oh, I should be keeping a diary. I should be keeping an old timey diary <laughs> for the people in the future to look at and be like, oh, your great, great grandma. This is what it was like for her. And then I like smacked my own self in the face and was like, dude, you've made like hundreds of paintings. Like that is your documentation of this time historically. So I, um, I really see art and the work uh, being made at this time as a time capsule. And, um, and again, that act of faith of creating it, even in dire times and the act of faith that it'll have some historical, uh, you know, historical uh, gravity at the future that people will care about it is, um, you know, really the, context that I see things through, the lens I see things through right now. And I might make a connection to what you said previously of, of having, having faith and trusting in the process as, yeah. as an artist. But that's, it, and it doesn't have to apply to art. It can be like life, trust yeah. the process. Because <laughs> yeah. we're here like, uh. <laughs> we're all here. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, uh, I know I have um, so many questions, other questions for you, but um, as we're about maybe 10 minutes left, I see some comments and questions in the chat. Um, so let me filter through back up. Um, so um, M, who was our uh, artist, guest artist at our last um, virtual art talk, um, made a comment. Uh, thanks for joining us, M. Um, they said, I appreciate the fingerprint and the idea of being a woodworker in order to respond flexibly to the current condition we are living in. Thank you for reflections on authenticity and not trying to present pristine representations in a time when it's maybe not possible. 
Oh, yeah, I'm a mess. <laughs> <laughs> no, and for me, like, even like, I work a lot with like styrofoam, which is like the most like horrible material ever. It's corrosive. It gets on the cats. It's so messy. Can't be recycled because it's almost there. Like even that, I'm like, oh, styrofoam, please tell me what you want to be like it's a tree and i do i i do have these intimate relationships with inanimate objects so great awesome <laughs> um great so uh jill said great talk thanks for doing this lex um and she says i'm interested in hearing more about your biggest influences and i'm, I'm guessing she's referring to like artists or other folks that are influencing you in your work um, that's a tough one because I'm largely self-taught. And so I don't, I, like I said, I really try to keep my eyes on my own paper and I really trust in my own vision. Not to say I never look at other artists. Um, but I know that, uh, Yayo Kusama definitely influences these pieces. There is that same repetition but also, um, you know, she gives you permission to get lost in her work. And that's the permission I give you to get lost in these mounds, to get lost in um, the form. Oh, that's great. I, I was thinking of, of her when you were talking about how you're using repetition in your work, actually. Hey, I hope one day to live like two blocks from my studio in an insane asylum too goals future goals future goals <laughs> 2021 um it could happen in 2021 <laughs> another question um that someone asks is is music relevant to the process of making your work do you do you work listening to something or do you prefer silence it's um it's a good question because music is a mystery to me and i listen to extremely obnoxious like music made by drag queens which in itself is not very good music but the mantras are like i'm a queen i'm so positive get on the dance floor who do you i'm a professional so for me it's again that reframing and recontext the context i'm not a, a music snob apparently but um at the majority of my time, I'm listening to really sad NPR. And someone pointed out like, oh, that's, you're balancing the right brain and the left brain with that. So either I'm like full hype mode, like high end music, or I'm like, the earth's going to end and we have a date for it. So, and, and again, it, making art is digesting reality for me. Yeah. <laughs> Balance, balance is definitely key for, for, for anyone in this last year. It's been really difficult. Yeah. I, I mean, love. I listen to a lot of podcasts about reality TV. I'm not a snob. Nothing is good enough. Too good for the people of this country. Or to inspire <laughs> amazing creativity, right? Uh, exactly. Um, Oh, there's a, uh, someone commented, I, I love hearing about your attitude of I can do whatever I want. Is this an attitude that comes naturally to you or is it something that you've had to cultivate? Uh, I definitely cultivate. But when people are like, oh, what is your personal motto? Or like, what would be your real housewives catchphrase? I don't think you probably don't even know what that is, Chelsea, but just nod. Um, it, it is, I live and die by Martha Stewart's yearbook photo, school yearbook photo quote, which was, I do what I please and I do it with ease. And things turned out pretty good for Martha. <laughs> even, even after a small stint in jail, she's doing great. She chose to go to jail. She chose not to fight it. <laughs> That's boss. Boom. She was leaning into it. She wasn't convicted. It was another life experience for her. <laughs> uh, love it. Uh, so what uh, was it? Clara commented that sleeping has been a huge coping mechanism for me as well. So uh, and you resonates. can get too too much sleep, Clara. Like it is a sign of depression. I'm always aware of it, but 
if you're depressed and you're sleeping too much, it's a better mode to be in than like hyper vigilant anxiety. So for me, it's like one of the two. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. I see you, girl. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Renee said, in a time that has been so politically charged, I find it interesting that your artwork tends to avoid explicitly political subject matters or pipe, pop iconography. How do you ride the line between internal coping versus actively avoiding current events and ex external stressors? Well, the, the process itself is escapism, except for the NPR. But for me, the work I mean, there's a lot of rainbows. So there's a lot of queerness in my work. And for me, the queer principle of, of celebration as sacred form of grieving and how that relates to oppressed cultures globally, like you can't, you can, you can enslave a person, but you can't take away their like joy of life. I mean, you can really mess that up. But for me, like I connect to those that, magical, realist, spiritual, um, divine action. So the politics aren't on the surface of my work, but they are the work. They're informing your process. Yeah, rainbows. Like. Yeah. Thanks, awesome. Renee. <laughs> um, Meg Haggard's joining us from Facebook um, and she asked, have you been collaborating with others during the pandemic via technology? Not real. I mean, I've done some Zooms and I've done some podcasts, not really visual work, but, um, you know, I wish I was Fran Leibovitz and I could just get paid to talk. So, <laughs> so this suited my like, ulterior motives nicely, Chelsea. That's a stepping stone, stepping stone. a stepping stone, stone yeah. <laughs> to, your, to your Netflix special. <laughs> totally. Um, we have one last comment. Um, uh, Cynthia said, thank you so much for being so authentic and honest. It's so refreshing and encouraging. Keep it up. Yeah, I'm only a, a snob, just keep myself out of trouble. Everything else is like fully, I just try to be myself and, you know, on all levels, not just art. Awesome. Well, and I, I want to um, second that. And there's another comment. Um, Devin said, appreciate the realness and insight into your mentality. I, I also want to second um, those two comments of your, um, your being so... 100% human, um, that in itself is a radical act and being so authentic with everyone um, is really fantastic. Um, but before we go, I have one last question for you is, um, I mean, we're talking about 2020. What is next for you in 2021? Well, I plan to get the vaccine, <laughs> but I still plan to stay home. Mm, how do you like them apples? And, uh, uh, you know, I would, I, I can't wait to get back to eating crappy cheese and drinking wine at art openings that cause me to get allergies. Like, uh, I will value that and not, um, you know, like rue those times. I, I will, I will have gratitude for that when it comes. And, um, I uh, hope to be able to create um, a mound in the public art context, a burial mound that would that in 2021 or 2022 would be amazing. Um, and uh, in the immediate future, I will have a Zoom paint with me class where I take people through projects and it's with the LGBT, Tucson LGBT Chamber. And I've done two other ones. We're doing one on February 13th. Uh, you buy your supplies and we have a supply list and um, uh, we're gonna paint something Valentine-y, a, a bouquet of kisses. And um, yeah, so I know you'll drop that link yeah, for people I to participate. And it's a, fun it's a fundraiser for, um, the LGBT Chambers UA 
um, scholarship fund. So everybody wins. That's a, a fantastic, fantastic yeah. cause. Uh, and a really great thing to do right before Valentine's Day or yeah, and it's, for yourself. For yourself, for your chosen family, for your, for, you can do it together or with a loved one, romantic. And everything you see here <laughs> comes with the, with the art class, meaning it is a safe space. You can't screw it up and we have a lot of fun. That's awesome. Well, I highly encourage all the folks here um, to, to register for that class. I, I dropped the link um, in the chat and I, I, I'm sure you've been sharing it on your social media pages as well if, if people aren't joining us in Zoom. Um, and those of us that are joining us on Zoom, I also put your the link to your um, artist page um, in the chat as well, so folks can follow your work there as well. So we, we only scratch the surface of some of the incredible works you've been making. I'm an enigma. <laughs> I, I encourage you all to check out Lex's work and see if you can uh, unravel the enigma, enigma that is Lex Jurassic. It's true. It's true. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself, Chelsea. <laughs> well, I am so sad that uh, it is now six o'clock um, and we've come to the end. It has been tears of a clown. It has been really just an absolute joy to sit and have a conversation with you. And I'm so appreciative again of, of you being so real and honest and sharing yourself and your time with everyone here today. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, and thank everyone else for joining us here today. It was really fantastic to have you all um, join in on the conversation. And thanks for um, offering some questions and comments in the chat. It was, it was lovely to see new faces and familiar faces. Um, and I hope that you all um, join us again in um, this month and next month when we have other artists from the Picturing 2020 back with us again. Um, so I invite you all come back and join us and stay safe, take care of each other and have an awesome night. Thank Bye. You Thank you everyone. <laughs>